Okay, great. So uh, welcome to the uh, Judicon uh, machine learning workshop. Um, so we're going to go through a few things today. Um, I'm going to start by telling you basically uh, a quick run through of some interesting things you can already do with Julie's machine learning ecosystem and some uh, trained models that you can grab and try out uh, very quickly and some demos of that. Um, and then Dennis here is going to take you through some KNet tutorials um, to actually show you some of the theory and how this stuff works under the hood. Um, you can follow along. So if you go on juliabox.com and log in with Google or, or I think GitHub as well, um, you can find the tutorials folder um, and then ML demos and the, the notebooks that we're working with are in here. I'll tell you which ones as they come up. And uh, we also have uh, a GPU instance of JuliaBox. If you go on jcgpu.juliabox.com, uh, you may or may not be able to load a GPU uh, version of JuliaBox. Uh, if it breaks down, just go on the normal version, that's fine. Um, but a lucky few of you might get to run a GPU for these demos. So I'll start with this. So um, one of the things we're kind of starting to push in the Julia community is the idea that you can make a lot of use of machine learning, uh, actually, even if you're not a machine learning researcher or someone who builds models yourself. Um, there's a ton of really, really useful tools out there that you can use like, like subroutines. And of course, you know, you might be familiar with tools like, you know, BLAST or OpenCV, things like that. If you're trying to multiply two matrices or, or you know, do a simple image, image segmentation, you don't have to write all of this from scratch, right? Or if you're using the Twitter API, you don't write all of that from scratch. You just grab a library and you do a quick function call and you're done. So we want to get to that kind of level of ease of use with machine learning tools in our ecosystem, in the Julia package ecosystem. And so to do that, what we've done is we've actually integrated deep learning models into many of our existing Julia libraries which means that you can you know, just package out a library, uh, pull it in, and start doing things like classifying images and uh, analyzing text and things like that. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples of things like that. So we'll start with an image classifier. So uh, this, there's a package called metalhead.jl. Uh, you can add with uh, package.addmetalhead. Um, uh, so let's load that package. And uh, Metalhead basically provides a whole suite of image recognition models. So you might have heard of a competition called uh, ImageNet, which is basically the, the state of the art you know, the competition where everyone submits their giant you know, machine learning models and deep learning models, uh, trying to classify uh, a large corpus of images, I think several million images, into uh, one of a thousand categories. So it's a very difficult challenge, and the top accuracies now are you know, getting above uh, 98 or 99%, so uh, they're getting really, really good at this. Um, we can use any, any image we like for this, so uh, if you enter a URL of uh, an image that, you, that you'd want to try out, uh, you can use the download function that Julia provides and just grab that image. And then using image, the images packages that we loaded earlier, we can just load that image up. So we load the image that we downloaded from this URL into the notebook, and we're going to see the elephant that we uh, that we loaded. So then we load a model. So this is provided by the Metalhead package. It's the VGG19. Uh, you, write, you might recognize the name if you're familiar with these ImageNet models. Um, so this is actually, uh, it's, we're constructing this model here. Not only are we constructing the model, but we're actually loading uh, some, some trained weights. So the first time you run this, it's going to take a while because it has to download uh, 500 megabytes of weights from a server we have, um, which stores, you know, this is like downloading a uh, a shared library or something like that, right? This is the binary fo format of machine learning. Um, is that the trained model? That's correct, yes, this is a trained model. So that, that's what we were doing. We just downloaded the weights and then we'll load those weights into the model. Um, we can look inside that model. We actually don't have to, but if we want to, we can look inside and say, look, what's going on inside that? You can see that it's a very deep model with lots of convolutional layers. Uh, I'm sure you'll learn more about that from Dennis later on. But the important thing here is that we're able to classify this. So we can take this image that we loaded in the notebook earlier and very simply call classify with the VGG we instantiated and pass in the image. And it's going to take a while to run the first time around while it compiles the model. Hopefully that's still working. There we go, let's go. 
sounds legit. I don't know. Uh, Tosca must be a kind of elephant or something like that. I don't know all the ImageNet classes, but that seems like a reasonable answer. Um, you can do this, you know, like I said, just grab a image URL, download the image onto your Julia Box account. You can try this, you can try this. So this is uh, Alan Edelman's dog. Um, we tried this and we, it thinks it's a coyote, so it's not sure on uh, all of these images, but it, it has a good idea. Um, let's look at one other example. Uh, so this is from the text analysis package. So uh, you should go to Avex and Gupta's workshop later on. It's going to take you through all these kinds of uh, natural language processing tools that we have in Julia. I'm just going to give you a very quick preview of one particular functionality that this uh, text analysis package has. So we're going to do a very similar thing here. We're going to load the text analysis package and then construct a sentiment analysis. Um, and this is, a, this is the exact same concept. So when we've constructed this model, uh, it's loaded all of the trained weights and so on, right? This, this comes you know, directly with the package when you installed it. Um, and it says, it tells you that you have a sentiment analysis model. Uh, this is a series of recurrent neural networks that were trained on the IMDB data set. So there's a very famous movie reviews data set um, in which the, uh, the reviews that you get from IMDB are linked to a star rating. And so you can work backwards and say, well, given the text alone, can we predict what the star rating is? And that gives you a model for how positive or negative is a given phrase that we've written down. And a neural network is able to kind of figure out those patterns and figure out whether a, a given sentence is positive or negative. And then we try it. So text analysis requires us to construct a string document. Um, and then we put it into the model very straightforwardly. And it gives us a score which tells us how positive or negative that sentence is. So in this case, it thinks uh, hello world is fairly neutral, but you know, maybe a bit positive. Uh, this has a higher 60% you know, chance of being a negative um, sentiment. Uh, and again, you know, these, are, these are much lower. Score? Sorry? What's a positive score? One? So uh, it's a uh, probability around 50%. And it, so it tends to be around 50%, and then higher is like high probability of yeah. being negative. What's the, so one means uh, being So uh, one will mean negative, right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So in this case, you have you know the one that's that's higher than fifty percent because it's a, a boring film. So that's very simple, and it's a very short notebook because it's very simple to do this. Go ahead. Right. So what type of model is it? This is a uh, LSTM. Yes, I believe it's something like three STL LSTM stuck together. So it's a fairly simple model that's just run over uh, word embeddings. So we this will not support. Uh, This will not support words that weren't, didn't appear in the uh, IMDb corpus. Um, but you can kind of find ways to work around that as well. And so in the future, we'll probably add more advanced models that maybe jump go down to the character level when you meet a word that you haven't seen before and things like that. Um, any other questions about these? So these are not the, uh, the only ways that you can uh, use uh, trained deep learning models. Um, one other way is that we have a really nice package called Flux.js, uh, which was uh, built by uh, one of our GSOC students this year, which actually allows you to export um, machine learning models to the browser. And so one example I have of this here, you can actually go uh, and try some of these examples. So this is a reinforcement learning model, uh, which is the carpool uh, challenge, which uh, if you haven't seen it before, basically you're trying to move this cart around and you're trying to stop the pole that's on the edge from uh, falling over. So it's a balancing act. And if you uh, try and play this yourself, you'll find that it's very, very difficult. Uh, but we have a model up here which is able to uh, actually play the game very effectively and get essentially an arbitrarily large score because it ends up finding a, a stable point over here. So we have a few of those models. I'm going to talk more about some of this technology in the talk I give on Wednesday. But that's kind of a preview of uh, all the different tools we have. And we'll gradually start expanding this so that you, know, you can do things like uh, putting in a reinforcement learning package and finding a pre-trained model that solves a given problem, and then kind of composing these things together to, to solve even harder problems. Uh, a good example of this is actually his neural style transfer. So let's find this. This is another GSOC student's work, uh, Avik Pal. Um, so the way you do style transfer is that you actually start with one of these trained, uh, trained ImageNet models. So you start by actually taking, you, you don't take the final classification, but you take some intermediate state that the model has produced, which represents some high level information about what the image look, looks like. 
and you're able to take that, that same model I showed you, the VGG19, and if you train it with, you know, in the, in the appropriate way with styles of images and, and content images, you'll get out something which is capable of style transfer, of applying uh, this style from one image to a, another photo with the content. Um, so that's the cool, the kind of thing, and the kind of nice things that you can do very easily when you have this kind of deep learning uh, models in your packages. So that's what I have. Uh, I'm going to turn you over to Dennis, um, who's the author of the KNet package, a very nice uh, machine learning framework in Julia, and he's going to give you an overview of uh, some of the theory behind this stuff. Okay, so before uh, um, I start boring you with my lecture, I'm going to show some demos to you. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, um, my, my research is on natural language processing and machine learning. Uh, so uh, I love these models which uh, play with text and relation of language with outside things. Uh, this was one of the demos by Andre Karpati. I don't know um, if you follow his blog, but uh, he did this a couple of years ago um, under the heading of the unbelievable effectiveness of um, recurrent neural network models. And uh, we just replicated it in, um, in a couple uh, functions. So I'm going to um, show that to you. So what this model does is basically uh, it's an LSTM which uh, is trained by reading text character by character. And uh, the goal is to take the context until a certain point in the text and predict the next character. And uh, what ends up happening is that if you actually train this model with Shakespeare, you can actually uh, turn it around and have it generate some random Shakespeare output. And if you train it on Julia code, then you know, it can actually generate some random Julia functions for you. So uh, the first demonstration is going to be on Shakespeare, so we're downloading the um, complete written works of Shakespeare from Gutenberg, and here's a sample, and uh, you know, if I can basically keep hitting this and we'll keep getting different samples of real Shakespeare here, okay? So uh, this is the data that the first model has been trained on. So now I'm going to um, demonstrate some fake Shakespeare. So this is actually uh, generated by the model itself. Okay, so uh, sometimes it's really good, sometimes it's stupid, but it's always original. And uh, if you don't read it very carefully, you might actually get you know confused with it. So and 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 you know, basically works forever. So one of my students took this model and actually wrote a um, jazz piano solo composer, downloaded a whole bunch of things. Uh, you know, scores from the internet, and I sometimes listen to that in the background because it's a you know music generator that never repeats itself and it's always original, not, not always melodic, but you know. <laughs> um, now we took the exact same model, slightly bigger in size, and applied uh, it to Julia code just to uh, show you the flexibility of the model. So here's a random set of um, Julia code from the uh, Julia base library. Okay, I can keep hitting this box, and we're basically seeing different parts of uh, Julia base, including comments, uh, function declarations, etc. And here's the output of the model generated with that. So as you can see, uh, it understands uh, Julia 7 syntax better than I do. <laughs> um, and it does you know, type declarations and stuff uh, usually correctly. Uh, it does indentation correctly. It actually has, uh, has comments for us humans to read, like <laughs> don't numerical types. I don't know what that means, but you know, it's, uh, um, and, and it, it can basically write programs forever. So every time you hit this, you'll get a different program. Okay? Well, there's a version of try parse. That's right. All right, so that was the um, 
first demo I wanted to show. The second demo um, is more close to my research. Uh, we're trying to figure out how to connect language to um, other modalities like images. And uh, one of the favorite tasks in that domain is visual question answering. Uh, this is the task where you actually has, have a picture. Uh, you ask a question about that picture, you know, what color is the tie uh, of the guy on the right in the picture or whatever. And uh, you expect the uh, model to look at the picture and give you a correct answer. So uh, this is um, the visual question answering uh, demo trained on the Clever data set. The Clever data set is an artificially generated data set uh, because people realized that uh, with photographs, everybody was cheating uh, because, you know, when, when you ask what color is something, it's 70% of the time it's red. So the computer just learned to say red and exploiting biases in data. So in order to prevent that from happening, um, we came up with the Clever data set, which is uh, Schrödel-like tabletop uh, object images in 3D, artificially generated. Um, questions about them, also artificially generated. So you can ask very convoluted things like, you know, what color is the sphere to the left of the green cube on top of this and that. Um, and uh, the model is trained by uh, showing basically uh, about half a million triples of image, question, answer, image, question, answer. So it starts knowing nothing. It doesn't have a vocabulary. It doesn't have a grammar. It basically learns everything from scratch by looking at these triples. And if you have a good enough model, um, and if you have train it with enough data, it actually um, uh, performs quite good in the test set. It gets uh, you know, 90 plus percent. Um, the model that I'm showing here is one of the first ones that uh, managed to um, focus uh, its attention in parallel um, and move its attention in parallel over the language and the image. That was one of the tough problems that we couldn't crack for a couple of years. Uh, this Mac model by Chris Manning uh, in Stanford about six months ago, uh, they published this, uh, manages to basically um, move through the image and the sentence step by step, each time focusing on a different part of the sentence and a different part of the image that is related to that sentence. So here is what an example image looks like. So we have a bunch of shapes of different colors and materials. And here is an example question answer pair. So the question says, what number of other things are there of the same shape as the small gray object? Okay, sometimes it's hard for me to parse these questions, you know, I have to read them a couple times. And the answer is one. I don't know if that's correct. Let's find a simpler question. Well, this is not, okay, so this was, well, let's ask our own question then. So, okay, let's start with um, a simple one. What color is the large uh, cylinder? Okay, blue is the correct answer. And not only do we get the correct answer, we can actually visualize what's going on inside the neural network. So that's uh, the nice thing about writing these things in Julia because everything is available to you as regular Julia arrays and you can open them up and look at what these things are doing. So we wrote this simple uh, visualize function for that. So this, we gave the model 12 steps. I don't know why we chose 12, but you know, that was what the paper did. So for 12 steps, the model focuses on certain parts of the sentence and certain parts of the image and tries to uh, generate the answer. So this visualization basically shows us, um, let me open this up. So these colors uh, are sort of its language attention. Remember the question was, what color is the large cylinder? So this is what color is the large cylinder? So obviously the last two uh, words are getting most of the attention in step one. And here above we state that large and cylinder are the uh, things that are attended. On the other hand, the model also has a visual side, which is basically focusing on different parts of the image. It's also uh, based on an ImageNet model like uh, Tom Mike showed us. And 
uh, you can basically see these light patches um, as the map of attention. So as it's focusing on the words large cylinder, it's actually a lot of uh, its attention is concentrated on the, uh, where the large cylinder is. And next, it pays attention to the question itself, what color, right? So I could assign what size, what material. So it focuses on what color. The visual attention doesn't do much um, in that case. And then after that, it's, it's basically what is, large cylinder, it keeps going because it's a simple question. It doesn't really need the 12 steps. But we can basically see what it's thinking if we ask a complicated question. But if you're asking about something that doesn't have a visual representation, you don't get anything in the silence in sort of map? Um, so what would, what would be an example? Well, like what's the color of the background? What is the color of the background? I never tried that. Let's try it. Oops, that's the wrong box. What is the color of the background? That may not have been in the training data. So yeah, it wasn't in the training data because the background turned into an unknown word. And uh, it just picked one of the objects randomly, I guess. Um, let's try one more question that's uh, a little more complicated. Um, Unfortunately, I'm colorblind. Is this gray? Okay. What is, <laughs> uh, what is the shape of the object uh, behind the gray cube? And it's a cylinder. Okay. And to make sure that it's not cheating, we can actually do the visualization. And we see that uh, the object of behind, uh, it's of the, it's focusing behind the, at least it's focusing on the right reference object and shifting its attention behind it. So at least, you know, we, we basically know that it's not looking over here and giving us a random answer. It's focusing on the right objects when it's giving us the answer. Yes? Is it possible to ask more complicated questions like where is the blue cylinder? Um, Depends on what the training set had. So the training set basically generated questions also automatically out of a complicated grammar, but it doesn't have all different types of questions, like it didn't have the background question, for example. So if we remain within the grammar that it was trained in, then we're likely to get a good answer. If we step outside, then uh, we don't. So I think they actually tested it uh, with Amazon uh, Turker questions. And uh, on the actual uh, automatically generated test set, the model does better than 95%. With real human questions, it's around 80%. So I guess 20% of the time people ask questions that are too creative for, for it. Okay. All right, so any other questions about the demos? Are we all motivated to learn more? Uh, it seems to me there that it may have paid attention to the word gray cube. Um, so I'm wondering, maybe it was cheating by cheating by using the behind of. Oh, the, there is the cube. There is the gray. Yeah, so the it's and and also I mean the, the, this is a bit yeah this is a bit uh, misleading because it only gives you the top two, okay. uh, but it doesn't tell you if it's ninety ten or fifty forty. You know it's, maybe it's a, like a smaller yeah it's yeah a that's true yeah. yeah so we need a better visualization of that. But again, I mean, this is a vector of, you know, 12 numbers, and we can visualize it in more creative ways to understand how this thing is working. Okay, so how does this stuff work? Um, I'm going to show you a few slides and then try to introduce a bit of uh, deep learning theory. And... Uh, I want to focus on what you can do just by knowing Julia and not much else, okay? So it turns out that a lot of models, uh, including the ones I showed you, can be implemented with Julia plus very little else. You don't need, you know, complicated frameworks like, you know, uh, Cafe or TensorFlow or whatever. So if you actually have a uh, good grasp of Julia and some automatic gradient package, a lot of these things are easy to implement. So um, so I taught a class in deep learning last semester. This is the five-slide summary. 
my students had to suffer for a lot more. Uh, so machine learning, in particular supervised learning, uh, of which all of the, these examples we showed are uh, instances of, except for the uh, pole balancing uh, one, uh, starts with observations. So observations consist of some inputs and some corresponding outputs. Now we can have uh, the inputs be an English sentence, outputs be a French sentence, and we're learning machine translation. We can have inputs being an uh, image and a question, output being the correct answer. We learn visual question answering. So you can basically fit any uh, type of learning problem into this framework. And in between, we have an unknown process. So we don't know how the human brain processes the image and the question and comes up with the answer, right? So we don't know this unknown process. So what do we do? Uh, for years, we tried to actually figure it out by doing psychology and creating cognitive models and programming things by hand, and it didn't work. Um, so lately, we got lazy, so we're doing, uh, we're taking inputs. We're basically writing a very flexible, parametric, differentiable program, of which all neural networks that you've heard of are instances. And this differentiable program uh, generates some predictions. We initialize this program with random weights. So initially, the predictions are going to be garbage. So we need a way to evaluate how good or how bad our predictions are compared to the real outputs. So for that, uh, we need a loss function. That's the final ingredient of uh, supervised learning. So we take the real outputs on the right and our predictions, uh, or on the left, right, the other left. And then we feed these things into a loss function. There are different loss functions used in the industry, but basically what a loss function means is how bad are my predictions, okay? And throughout this whole modeling process, all we have to pay attention to is that every operation we do is differentiable. And uh, why is that important? Because what's going to happen is um, I'm going to tell the computer to minimize this loss function. And in order to do that efficiently, uh, the computer has to uh, figure out the derivative of the loss function output with respect to each of the parameters inside this big parametric program. Some of these programs have millions of parameters. Uh, very deep visual networks have uh, a lot of parameters. But the, uh, the basic algorithm we use basically says, if I jiggle this parameter a little bit, how much is the loss going to change? Is it going to go up or down? Okay, And uh, we can do that if we keep all our operations differentiable. Um, so if we, uh, we used to write these uh, gradients or derivatives by hand, which is very error prone and you can't actually do it with very complicated models easily. So now we actually do automatic differentiation. That's the only piece that you need on top of Julia to write these and train these models. So remember the loss function, it had, uh, well, I, di I didn't show it very, uh, detailed, but basically it had three inputs. The W represents the parameters of the model, the weights. X is our input, Y is our desired output, and F, the loss function, basically takes these ingredients and says, with this W, if I predict things, I'm going to be this bad compared to the gold answers Y, okay? So we take this and, uh, at least in um, KNet, we pass it to a higher order function called grad. Grad is a higher order function because it takes functions and returns other functions. So in particular, in this case, it takes F, the loss function, and it returns G, the gradient of the loss function. Now, um, I'm assuming that not a lot of you actually remember your calculus classes from uh, back when. Uh, so what does the gradient look like? So G, if G is the gradient function, it takes exactly the same inputs as F, okay? But instead of generating a scalar output, a single number like F, uh, it generates something a bit different. It generates this grad F. Now, what kind of object is this grad F? So this thing, whatever it is, it has exactly the same size and shape as the input. So for example, if you're taking gradient with respect to W, then the output of G is going to have the exact same size and shape as W, exact same number of elements, okay? And every entry in this output 
is going to tell us how sensitive the loss is to that particular weight. Okay, it's that simple. So it's basically um, an array with the sensitivities. Once we have that, um, so the, yeah, I'm emphasizing again, the output of F is a scalar, the output of G is something that's the same size as W because it's basically telling us what each component of W is doing in terms of affecting the loss. Um, this is my final slide, promise. And then we'll get to run some code. Um, so this is the basic training algorithm that um, we use to train these things. It's called stochastic gradient descent. Um, it has three inputs, uh, what W, the parameters as usual, these are chosen at random initially. You don't have to pay too much attention to them, although good initialization helps with the optimization. Um, the loss is the function that we, we've seen before. It takes W, X, Y and tells you how bad your predictions are. Um, I'm using the grad down here to calculate the gradient of the loss with respect to W. And once I have that, um, I can go over the data, which I assume is a bunch of X, Y pairs. Um, and I can calculate the gradient of, with, for that particular XY pair, and then um, the gradient is the direction of the steepest ascent, so basically if I step in the gradient direction, then I would increase the loss, so I want to step in the opposite direction to decrease the loss. That's why there's a minus sign here. And I also don't want to take a step that's too big and make this thing actually um, unstable. So I usually multiply my step size with some small number like 0 0.01, which is called the learning rate. Okay? So all the hoopla about deep learning in the last five years basically is pretty much, you know, summarized in this slide. Uh, the rest is sort of, you know, details and um, a bit more... Uh, embellishments of this algorithm. So uh, this actually summarizes most of machine learning. So what is deep learning? Deep learning has nothing to do with actually uh, have, having a more profound understanding of what you're learning or whatever. It, it sounds like that. It's a good marketing name, but deep, deep learning only means that there is multiple layers to your model. So the, the, the model is actually physically deep, not conceptually deep. Now, what kind of software infrastructure do you need to train and use these models? Well, you need a bunch of things. You need a language to express your models. Uh, you, need a GP, you need GPU support because most of the large models these days cannot be easily trained on a CPU in a feasible amount of time. Uh, automatic differentiation is important. You, trust me, you don't want to write your own derivatives. I spent you know, most of the last two years doing that and it's not fun. And some optimization algorithms, you know, there are the ones that are a little smarter than SGD. So uh, the, in the tutorial that I'm going to give you next, uh, we're going to use Julia as our modeling language. So basically, we're going to express taking our parameters, our inputs, calculating a prediction, and calculating our loss function in pure Julia. We're not going to use um, any additional uh, functions or structs. And the last three, uh, I'm going to use my package Knet uh, to implement. So Knet and Flux are right now uh, the two popular machine learning packages in Julia, and Mike and I are trying to converge them so that we actually have uh, one package uh, soon. Okay, so <clears throat> how are we doing with time? Are we going to have a break or should we just keep going? I think just keep going, yeah. Okay. All right. He's a tough teacher. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the first um, couple examples I'm going to show you, you can also follow this from the... Um, Julia box, everything is uh, where Mike uh, showed it earlier. I'm going to run my own version because I, I like running this like a slide. All right, so um, the first couple models I'm going to show you are supposed to illustrate basic concepts of machine learning. What are the basic concepts of machine learning? Basically training and testing, mini-batching your data, overfitting, 
namely not doing as well on unseen data as you are on the training data and how to overcome that limitation. Um, and model efficiency. We'll see that for some problems, some models actually work better and converge faster than others. Okay? So uh, that's a lot to cover in a short period of time, but I'm going to hopefully uh, manage. Okay, so first let's look at our data. Uh, we're going to use the Drosophila of machine learning called MNIST. Okay, everybody who starts machine learning starts with this data set. It's a handwritten digit recognition data set. It was one of the first data sets or first problems where uh, neural networks were commercially successful and they actually started getting used in the US for reading checks, uh, handwritten checks and such. Um, so we're going to read this data set to four regular um, Julia arrays. <clears throat> and uh, I just want you want to just uh, sh talk about the types of these things a little bit. So X, X train and Y train are the training data. X test and Y test are the test data, inputs and outputs. The X's are four dimensional tensors. So here is the, here is the training one. So it says 28 by 28 by 1 by 60,000. Uh, people who deal with images uh, like uh, putting their data in these high dimensional tensors. Uh, these numbers uh, mean the following. 28 by 28 is the size of the image. 1 is the number of channels. So that would be 3 for an RGB image. But MNIST is a grayscale, so it has only one channel. And the last dimension, 60,000, is the number of images in this whole tensor. So we've stuck the whole thing into one big array, okay? Um, the labels, the Ys, the correct answers, are basically 60,000 integers. So these are things like 0, 1, 2. Um, and the same thing for X test and Y test, except instead of 60,000, we have 10,000 uh, test data, okay? And here we can actually view the first five examples in our test set. So that's what the images look like. Okay? So there's 60,000 of these for training and 10,000 for testing. And here is what the labels look like. I uh, represented them 8 bit to save space, but basically you can see that uh, it says 721A, which means 10 and 4. Why is this 10? Because Julia doesn't like zeros. And we replace all the zero labels with tens so that we can have one based uh, indexing later. Now, next we're going to mini batch. Why do we mini batch? So, when I showed you the SGD algorithm earlier, I said we pick an XY pair and then we compute loss and its gradient and we update our W a little bit. Okay? So, it turns out that if you actually pick single XY pairs, that's inefficient takes a long time. And if you uh, pick a lot of, if you put together uh, a lot of XYs together, like the 60,000 tensor that we see, we've seen, if you use that, that's also inefficient with the current computer architectures. Uh, so somewhere in the middle is the sweet spot where the convergence is fastest. And for MNIST, that corresponds to something like putting 100 or, or taking 100 images at a time. Okay, that's called a mini batch. Uh, why isn't it called a batch? Because batch learning means something else. Batch learning means like taking the whole thing together. So we call these guys mini batches. So what I'm going to do is uh, remember the 60,000 large tensor. I'm going to split it into 100 image uh, mini batches. So when I do that, I have 600 training mini batches and 100 test mini batches. So the SGD algorithm is going to take one mini batch at a time compute a gradient, take a little step in the opposite direction, okay? okay so here is the first mini batch. Again, each mini batch is a XY pair, but this time instead of having one image or 60,000 images, it has 100 images and their answers. Okay, any questions about the data so far? We took 60,000 images, we grouped them into 100. So this basically, um, the way we're going to calculate the loss is going to rely on giving correct answers to each one of them. 
what we're going to do is we're going to write a model which gives a probability for each answer for each image and we're going to um, calculate the negative log probability of the correct answers that's going to be our loss function we're going to go down on that yeah so I, I can see there that you are using some GPU variables uh, a GPU oh so uh, okay so let me uh, explain that so um, the way we use GPUs uh, in Julia is basically by uh, specifying an array type. So if you specify an array type that's a GPU array, and there is several versions of that in Julia, then your array will be created or transferred to the GPU memory. So GPUs are strange beasts. I didn't know what GPUs actually did until a few years ago. But now the way I think of GPUs is, is like a little mini computer that sits somewhere you know, on your computer with its own memory and own processor. Uh, the processor is very dumb. It can only do certain things, not everything, but it can do those things very fast. So one example is matrix multiplication. We're going to do that a lot. So sometimes it actually makes more sense to transfer your arrays to the GPU memory and multiply them there and transfer back uh, than trying to do the same thing on CPU. Yeah. So you optimize all these functions yourself with uh, some sort of uh, uh, GPU backend like CUDA or? Yes. So the, as soon as you transfer, from the user's perspective, it doesn't matter. Instead of declaring an array, you declare a KNET array and your array gets created on the GPU. If you multiply it with another array, that operation takes place in the GPU. You write the same code. The code doesn't change, okay? Uh, from my perspective, yes, there is a lot going on because each time you do an operation with a GPU array, I need to write the kernel for it or call the write function for it uh, in order for that operation to work just like in Julia base. So but we try to make that as transparent to the user as possible. In terms of library dependencies? Yes. yes. Right now, we also did rely on CUDA and, okay. and CUDA libraries, yes. Uh, there is also, a, um, for non-CUDA GPUs, we have. Sorry? For, for non-NVIDIA GPUs, we oh, also yeah, have. Oh, uh, yeah, CL arrays. CL yeah. arrays. So, OK. okay. okay. So um, th this mini batch function actually returns an iterator, and that iterator copies each little mini batch into a GPU array or a regular array depending on that type. So that that X type that that's been declared. So it's one of the keyword arguments. You can control other things about it as well. But you, um, I don't know if that answered the question or your question is this is bad coding practice for Julia and I would have run it differently. <laughs> That's correct, but it doesn't need to for, for this case. Okay, so now that we understand the data, let's uh, train a model. And the simplest model of all uh, is known as the perceptron or logistic regression or softmax or linear, you may have heard any of these things, they all mean pretty, pretty much the same thing, except for a couple details. Um, and I'll show you exactly what they are in a little bit. So what's a linear model? This is a linear model, okay? So a linear model basically predicts the output by uh, applying a linear function to the input. And a linear function for us is basically a matrix multiplication plus um, a bias vector addition. Okay, so in this definition, I assume that W is a tuple of two things. The first thing is a weight matrix. The second thing is a bias vector. And when you give me an input, uh, like the whole image, with uh, it's 28 times 28 pixels, um, I take this as a vector, multiply it by W. Uh, this mat 
uh, reshapes the thing to be a 2D matrix and add a bias. And that's it. It's a very, very simple model. Okay? So. Um, so remember that our X's were four dimensional, okay. right? So an individual X is a three dimensional cube. So I'm basically resizing that to be a um, you know, two dimensional matrix, 784 by N matrix. So that's like a four mini batch. Each, right. Each right. So each mini batch comes to you as 28 by 28 by 1 by 100. And I reshape that to 784 by 100 so that I can use matrix multiplication. That's right. Um, so here's what our actual weights look like. I mean, this is complicated, but I just want to show you the um, dimensionality. The weight matrix is 10 by 784. Mm -hmm. So what happens if you multiply that matrix with a 784 vector? You get 10 by 1, right? So you get 10 numbers. Those are the scores for the 10 possible digits. And the convention for linear models is basically the highest score wins. Whichever score uh, uh, is the highest is the digit that we choose. And the bias vector is 10 by 1. So we're basically converting a 784 dimensional uh, input to a 10 dimensional output using a linear function. Okay? Um, so here is the first mini batch again. And let's do our first prediction. So I fed this mini batch to uh, my linear function, and I call the output y pred. This is my prediction, and this is what my prediction looks like. Okay? So remember, this is for 100 images. Each column of this matrix are the scores for one image. Okay? So for example, if you look at this column, these are the scores for the last image. There is 10 scores. And these are the scores for the digits 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 10, which represents 0. And in this particular case, the highest score wins. So my model right now thinks that this particular image is a 0. Okay? Yes? Why do you choose to make W a K material, not just a Julia uh, Because I want to do my, uh, if I have a GPU, uh, multiplying matrices on the GPU is a lot faster. Right, so that's basically how, how um, the user decides where they want the operation to take place. So if you actually give me two Julia arrays, you're asking me to do it on the CPU. If you give me two Knet arrays, you're asking me to do it on the GPU. Okay? Now, if you look at the correct answers, of course, the correct answers have nothing to do with, the, with my score. So, for example, the last score, you know, this was supposed to be a zero, but the actual correct answer is nine. Of course, not because W was initialized randomly. Remember, in the beginning of training, all our weights are initialized randomly, right? In fact, I can actually calculate the accuracy for this mini batch, 10%, which is expected. Um, Dollar sign. Where is your? Uh... Yeah, there we go. Okay. And accuracy on the whole data set is also close to 10%. Why is it 10%? Because I have 10 possible answers. If I'm guessing randomly, I'm going to get 10% of them correct. Okay. So right now, we're a very bad student guessing at random. Final ingredient: the loss function. I'm going to define a loss function here. I'm not going to talk about the details much, but basically. Uh, what, it's, what this loss function is doing is converting your scores into probabilities and then looking at the log probability of the correct answer. Okay? So that's the thing you want to maximize or negative that is the thing you want to minimize. So uh, if we calculate the loss of the first mini batch, we get 2.3. Does anybody have a guess as to what 2.3, what's special about 2.3? It's, log of, it's negative log of 1 over 10. Yeah. Okay, so one, remember, if I'm guessing randomly, I'm probably assigning the correct answer, probability 1 over 10 on average. And negative log of that happens to be 2.3, and that's why the general loss 
um, in this case is 2.3. Okay, so calculating the gradient is easy. I use the grad function as I mentioned earlier. Um, so let's try to see what this grad function does again. So first, as I mentioned before, um, my original W's have size 10 by 784 for the matrix and 10 by 1 for the bias vector. And if I look at the output of the gradient, G1, I see that it has exactly the same size and shape. It has two components. The first one is a matrix, the second one is a vector. So that's common. Why is it like this? Because I'm going to repeat until you guys get bored. Every component over here in the G tells you how much the corresponding component of W affects the loss. Okay? So if soft this comp Soft grad, we actually defined it in the previous slide. I passed it quickly because it's so easy now in KNet. So soft max is the actual loss function that computed everything. And I just said grad of that, and that gave me another function automatically that will calculate the gradient. Um, so just to make sure I drive this point home, um, let's look at the second component of G G1, the gradient. Okay, so remember the second component was a uh, 10 length vector. Uh, it's got a bunch of numbers. So I want you to focus on this last number. What does this last number mean? The last number is 0 0.34. Does anybody want to tell me what this number means? Let's see if you were listening. Did you want to raise the so this number means if you raise the corresponding weight by epsilon, okay, the loss is going to increase by 0 0.34 epsilon. That's what I mean by gradient, derivative, sensitivity, etc. Okay, so every number in this vector tells you how sensitive your loss is to the corresponding number in the weights, in the original model parameters. Can you go back to the gradient function again? Sure. So, the soft grad, what, I mean, you have basically many input inputs. You have W, you have X, you have Y. Then if you press show for respect to W and X. By default, only the first argument. Only the first argument. Right. So, so, I want to compute basically like adversarial example. I want to press show for respect to uh, X. Will you do it for me as well? Um, yes, you can specify it as saying arg number equals 2, or you can define your function by flipping the first two things. So, yes, there is ways to do it. But by default, I, I'm sorry I forgot to mention that. By default, grad takes the gradient with respect to the first input only. Okay, so 0 0.34, remember that number? I'm going to actually test this theory now. Here is the original weights. We actually initialize... Uh, weight matrices randomly, but we usually keep the biases at zero. So my original W was, had zero biases. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the loss with the original weights. And now I'm going to add an epsilon to that last number, which I saw the um, sensitivity for. So instead of zero, now it's 0 0.1. And, oh no, the answer. Um, so you didn't see that. So the question is, what's going to happen to the loss? Remember, the sensitivity was 0 0.34. So if I increase this by 0 0.1, what do you expect happens to the loss? It's going to increase by 0 0.34 times this. Okay, so that's 0 0.03 roughly, so from 282 it's going to become 285. So that, just so that, you know, we're not cheating and everything is working according to our uh, specifications. So now I'm hoping that you can feel the importance of this gradient in your bones, okay? So here is a bunch of numbers that tell us how to reduce the loss. For each one of my parameters, I know exactly what's going to happen if I just move that parameter uh, a little epsilon, how much the loss is going to change and in what direction. 
given that very valuable information, I can keep changing my parameters in the direction that I choose, and I will reduce the loss doing that. So back in the day, I'm not going to go over this, but before we wrote the grad, the automatic gradient uh, differentiation functions, this is the type of code you needed to write to actually manually compute the same gradient. You don't want to see that. Okay, but you know, just to make sure it gives the same answer. I try to make it as efficient as possible every day. No, no, but, but do you see the difference in efficiency that the automatic differentiation sometimes screws up, or uh, it's always giving you more efficient code than manual? Um, so it turns out that most of the time is spent on GPU kernels and matrix multiplications, and a little bit of overhead trying to calculate gradients doesn't actually affect your overall performance that much. So overall gradient calculations um, is less than 10% of the cost of training your uh, data, the overhead, not I shouldn't say calculations, the gradient overhead is a very few uh, percentage of the total cost. Okay, so we've seen the training loop before. So let's train our model using this training loop. Now this went fast because I actually cheated and did this earlier, so it just loaded it from the file, but ignore that. And now we can actually see how the error changed during this training. <clears throat> All right, so here we observe a few things. Uh, so first of all, the x-axis says epochs, and epoch is one complete uh, processing of the training data. So I'm basically going over the same training data a hundred times in this graph. And for every time that I go over it and I make my small adjustments, I note the loss or the error. Um, loss and error are different. Loss is the, this negative log probability thing that we calculate. Error is what you expect it to be. It's the percentage of questions that I'm answering incorrectly. So the error starts at 90% and it falls down rapidly and at the end it converges to somewhere between 7 and 8% Okay, for this linear model. Now the red curve is for the test set, these are the images I've never seen before, and the blue curve is for the training set. Uh, and as you can see, uh, as is typically in these cases, I do better on the training set slightly than on the test set. That's called overfitting, okay? And you can also see that the tra even the training set error after 100 times of seeing the data is not zero. It's still, you know, about 7%. That's called underfitting. So my model is both too simple. It can't actually memorize the data and give me zero error on the training set, even though I showed it to him 100 times. And there's a slight difference uh, between the two errors. So those are the two problems that we need to fix. So this is a little uh, Jupyter thing that I am very proud of, uh, of being able to write. This is going to visualize the weights the model learns over the epochs from 1 to 100. What I did here is uh, the W weights are normally... Uh, this 10 by 784 matrix, each row of that matrix has the same number of entries as an image. So I turn them into images. So this is basically the visualization of those weights. Um, the gray is zero, uh, white is positive, you know, blacks are negative numbers. So as you can see, this yes, this is the linear classifiers weights. As you can, you know, if you squint your eyes, you can see the digits in there. Okay, so it's, it's trying to um, represent the digits in these weights, or average of a lot of different digits in these weights. Okay, so should I do it again? I love doing this. So you can slowly see the digits emerging as the training goes on. And after a while, the shapes don't change, but you know, the black and white patterns become 
more pronounced, that's when it's actually overfitting. You know, there is not a line that goes exactly through this particular point, so it paints it black. But of course, you know, in the test set, you're going to see a line that goes through that point, and that's why the test set is uh, worse than the training set. All right, so we learned um, training, testing, mini batching, loss functions, SGD. You finished half of my class, and we're able to get 92% accuracy on MNIST. Okay, not, not good enough to sell to the banks, but you know, not too bad either for our first attempt. So any questions before I improve this a bit further? All right, how much time do we have? We have an hour left. All right, excellent. Um, yes? Rewinding quite far back, at the beginning you defined that the type, which was the array type, which was either a GPU type or... Um, quite often in, on the Julia discourse, people argue that Julia should be compiled for speed. We don't want this interpreted language. Um, if you're going to do this in C, you would have a lot of FDEFs. So you would FDEF and have a GPU. Uh -huh. and you, you would basically have two versions of the code, one for GPU systems and one for non-GPU systems. That's right. And here, it's just at runtime it chooses. That's right. Oh, wow. <laughs> and depending on the type. So we, we, we're living the advantage of having a multi, yeah. multiple dispatch language, right? Mm -hmm. So at runtime, if it sees your types to be one, it calls the GPU functions. Well, that, if it's the other... Yeah, yeah. All right, so how do we improve on this? Um, so the, the, uh, the linear model in terms of neural network picture looks like 10 neurons, okay? These 10 neurons each are connected to all the pixels of the image and each one of them is trying to recognize one thing. Okay, so that's the perceptron, linear model, etc. picture. So people immediately thought, you know, back in the 60s when the limitations of these linear models became apparent, people of course knew that um, having more layers and more neurons was the way to go, but they didn't know how to train them. Okay, so until around 1980s, when we rediscovered the chain rule of calculus, which was invented by Leibniz and Newton, you know, 300 years ago, uh, we couldn't actually train these uh, networks with multiple layers. So in this example, I'm going to do that. Uh, and at first, we're going to change um, our prediction function slightly. I'm going to uh, go get there step by step. In my first attempt, Remember, in the linear function, W had only two components. Now, what I'm going to assume is uh, W is going to have two N components. There's going to be N layers, okay? So I'm going to take the components of W two at a time. These components are going to be weight matrix, bias vector, weight matrix, bias vector, weight matrix, bias vector, okay? So I'm taking them two at a time. I'm doing the same thing I did before the linear function. Okay, multiply with WI, add WI plus one as a bias. And using this function, I can represent chains of linear functions of any dimensionality I want, just by adjusting the uh, weights in the W. Any questions about this? My so-called multilinear model. Don't use this, it's bad. But we're gonna see why it's bad. So I have a slightly more complicated W in it, but it's actually easy to use. You basically say, here's my input size, here's my intermediate layer size, 64, and here's my output size, 10, and it gives you all the weights. Okay, so it first goes from 784 to 64, here's the bias, and it goes from 64 to 10, and here's the bias for that. So we have four arrays inside W instead of two. That represents the two layer um, neural network. We calculate the loss. It's still 2.3 because we're basically random. We train this thing and we plot and compare with the linear.
And uh, what do you think is going to happen? This is going to be the same. Why is it going to be the same? Because multiple linear functions composed together is still a linear function, right? So we didn't actually add anything by uh, going through all these hoops. So, and you can see here, still all my performances are in the 7, 8% error range, okay? So and here's the mathematical explanation of why they're the same. So this is the function I'm calculating, w times x plus b, and other w times that plus b, right? So that's the two linear function composed together. If you play with it a little bit, you realize it's just another linear function. So we didn't improve the expressiveness of our model, therefore the results are basically the same. Okay. Now, I'm going to add literally one line to this model, and it's going to change a whole lot. So be careful about this one line. Let's clean it up. Okay. So, still the same deal. W has these pairs of weights. I take two at a time. I calculate the linear function. But for all the layers except for the last one, I apply some sort of nonlinear function, element-wise nonlinear function to the output. Okay, so that's the only line I'm going to add. Now I'm using the rectified linear function called ReLU in this example, which is basically um, maximum of 0x, so it looks like this, which is a very popular nonlinearity these days. But it turns out that you can use sigmoid here, tan h here, absolute value, square, cube, whatever you want, and you pretty much get the result that I'm going to show you. Yes? Yes, except for that one point, which we don't care about. Okay. So the, the, the yeah. So we, we fudge. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. So in, in practice, yeah, it doesn't hurt us. Okay. So that one nonlinear function, again, remember, we're taking the x, we're applying a linear function, and then we put, you know, we, we, we do ReLU on it. What does that mean? We basically replace every negative number with zero, right? That's what it means. And then I do it again and I replace every negative number with zero. That's the only change that I have made in this code. And the initial loss is still 2.3, but what a difference does it make? And here's the plot. Um, there we go. You see it better here. So now the scale changed. Okay, so these were the two lines that we saw earlier with the losses around um, six, seven, eight percent. And look at our losses now. Okay, just that one line basically brought the training error uh, from about seven percent to zero. So just by adding one hidden layer of 64 units, we can actually get zero percent error on our 60,000 training examples, okay, with the nonlinearities. And the test error went from 8% to 2%. So now instead of having a 92% accurate classifier, we have a 98% accurate classifier. And it's all due to that one little ReLU line that we added in the code. How okay? many layers did you add in? Hmm? How many layers? Two. Two. That's the minimum you need in order to stick a nonlinearity in between. Any questions? Um, in terms of expressive power, it is true. The, f the space of functions you can express is limited to linear functions. In terms of regularization or optimization, they might behave differently. So that's why the results were slightly different, for example. It didn't exactly converge to the same spot. Um, but in terms of you know, performance, it's not going to make much of a difference un unless you put those nonlinearities in between. That's right. So we can improve the overfitting, and here's the overfitting, right? Mm -hmm. So even the linear model was overfitting, and by using regularization, which I'm going to mention in a little bit, we could actually close this gap a little. But the main problem with this model is not overfitting. 
it's underfitting this distance. Okay, so this distance is underfitting, this distance is overfitting. So the, the linear model is not flexible enough, does not have enough capacity to represent uh, this digit recognition problem. So as soon as we uh, go to a multilayer perceptron, which is basically the name for this, you know, multiply, relu, multiply, relu business, uh, we get a much better result. Now, at this point, I don't have an underfitting problem anymore because I can literally memorize the training set. I have 0% error on the training set. The only problem I have is overfitting, and I'm going to discuss how to solve that. Yeah. Would it be worth it to have a relu for most of the layers and uh, just a small layer than F uh, for the last one? It makes small differences in terms of training speed, in terms of the exact uh, value it converges, but uh, it wouldn't make that much of a difference. It would basically this gap would still be observed. This improvement would still be observed had we used sigmoid or 10h. Would it make any difference to um, That's usual standard practice. So every time you're going over the data, um, you want to randomize the examples you're looking at. Um, this is important in some data sets where, for example, all the positive examples are in the beginning and all the negative examples are at the end. Okay? If you're training with the data like that, then you're, you're basically doing it very inefficiently. If you shuffle them up, you'll, com you'll converge faster. You mean the same in the back case that it converges slower? Yes, if, if there is a grouping of all the positive and all the negative examples, it converges slower. It doesn't ma make that much of a difference in this problem. Yes. So we're obviously beyond the batches, the mini batches. Right. Is any theory about either the mini batches? Very the good question. question. My favorite topic. So, <laughs> so we're computing losses on mini batches. That's an important observation. What we really want is the loss on the whole population, right? So we have a model. What we're really curious about is what is the loss of this model on all possible handwritten drawings space? Now, we can't answer that question because we don't have access to that space. We only have access to a sample of that space, and that sample is my training set, which has 60,000 instances, right? So I can calculate loss based on that 60,000 sample, which will be a highly accurate uh, gradient. But instead, I choose to um, do it on a mini batch of 100 which is slightly more noisy, right? It's not pointing me in the right direction exactly because it's a very sm much smaller sample, but I claim it's better. Anybody have any comment on that? So the smaller we make the size of the mini batch, the more noisy our gradient direction becomes because of sampling error. However, the faster I can calculate it because I need to multiply fewer numbers, right? So it turns out, if you care about convergence speed, exact accuracy doesn't matter that much. Why? Because these are very convoluted spaces. They're not simple convex spaces, so you step a little bit and then the direction changes completely. So if you wasted all this time originally to calculate an exact direction, it's not going to be useful to you in the next step because the direction is going to change anyway. So I might as well do a quick and dirty, you know, fast calculation based on a small sample size and keep changing my samples through this mini batching. Uh, and that's basically when we get the best convergence rates. Well, I guess like you could do a size of one at a time. Right. So actually I, I, I did that experiment from one to 60,000, you know, doubling every time. And somewhere around 100, 200, 500 range is where the convergence speed is maximum. Yes, so there's two types of parallelism with multiple GPUs. There's model parallelism, there's data parallelism. Uh, back in the day in 2012 when the ImageNet uh, it, victory was achieved by Hinton and his student, they were using model parallelism. They, they were basically distributing their model into multiple GPUs because it didn't fit on the memory of a single GPU. GPUs have smaller memories than uh, regular computers. Uh, back in the day, I think the biggest GPUs had four gigs. So they had to use two GPUs with eight gigs and distribute some layers in this one and other layers in this one. Uh, so that's model parallelism, and it's hard to get right. 
because of the um, synchronization issues between the two GPUs. You end up basically, if you don't do it right, one GPU ends up waiting for the other to finish something and you don't utilize them correctly. The simpler mo mode of parallelism is data parallelism where you basically send different mini batches to the two GPUs. They do their own calculation at their own pace and at some point they send you back their losses and gradients and you combine them and make a move and then you know that, that's, that's done very often so and more, more easily. Say it again. You're always computing that. No, you computing a stochastic one. If I have many, many of them, then I compute all of them at the same time, more or less, and I'm basically getting back 60% direction. No, you can so that's, you still have a sample of 60,000. You don't have the population, okay? So you, you can have a b bigger mini batch, but don't think that that's the population. That's still a little sample of the whole population, right? So even if you had infinite GPUs, we don't have infinite data. So your, your, your steepest descent direction calculation is always going to be an estimate because of the finiteness of the data. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, how is that automatic differentiation implemented? I'm just using the to drive the uh, gradient function, that's why? No, you only need to use this one grad. <coughs> so Mike and I worked long and hard to make all of Julia differentiable. <laughs> <laughs> so that you didn't have to write the gradients yourselves. Okay, so if you, act, if you implement your loss function using Julia, regular Julia functions, for loops, if conditions, whatever, regular Julia language, then our packages can differentiate that. It's implemented in the package, packages. So okay. Mike has uh, a, an AD package, Knet itself uses another autograd package. But they're implemented in packages right now. What about Flux? Flux uses uh, uh, Mike's AD package. Yeah, similar we approach. Wanna... Although, um, so we're, we're moving gradually to doing more and more work in the compiler, actually. Yeah. So eventually, we're hoping to get to the point where we can kind of do a lot of the AD transformation on your source code, basically. Um, but for now, this is using more of like an operator overloading uh, style approach where you so the Knet array type that Dennis showed you is something where if you do a matmol with two Knet arrays, it will do the matmol under the hood, but it will also record the fact that a matmol happened on, on a tape. And then, uh, so you have that record of all the operations, then you can go back through it to differentiate it. Um, does that get out of that? <laughs> but oh, yeah, AD is another, another whole talk by, by itself, so yes. uh, we can, talk about it offline, yeah. Uh, one last uh, mini question regarding mini batches. You said that you did the experiment from one to 60,000. Yes. And so uh, it was really easy, okay, and, and uh, they um, ballpark uh, from how, how much slower is, let's say, mini batch of 10 or 1,000 compared to Why don't we just run it at the end if there is some time? Because we can, we can really do it easily here. Okay. Uh, but basically, you know, it could be five to 10 times slower if you do the wrong mini batch size. To follow up briefly on the, the AD stuff, so the AD that's working in your packages now, are you guys um, sort of developing completely independent of the sort of cassette and capstan AD approach? That's no, nobody's really independent, everybody's talking to each other. Right. <laughs> but we haven't uh, converged yet. Fair enough, so but we're the plan is to converge? Yes, yeah. like yes. Okay. The plan is to have one best AD that yeah. everybody is going to use and it's gonna be the fastest <laughs> and greatest. Um, but yeah, for that, Jared needs to finish his cassette first, and, uh, and for that, the compiler people need to mm -hmm. do certain things, and okay, enough about AD. Any other questions? All right, so um, my next focus is going to be how to get rid of this gap. Okay, so this is the most important, one of the most important lessons in machine learning, this gap between the training performance and testing performance, known as overfitting is something that will haunt you, and you better have some tools to deal with it. There is usually two types of popular tools to deal with it, regularization and dropout. Regularization adds a component to the loss function which penalizes large magnitude weights. And dropout does something really silly but seems to work better. So we're going to look at dropout now. 
Okay, so um, I'm going to add one more line to our model. Okay, so this is the new line. Everything else is still the same. This one line says, you know, apply this dropout function to x. What's the dropout function? The dropout function simply drops a percentage of the values or replaces them with zeros. Okay, so imagine these intermediate arrays that I'm generating from the linear multiplications and the um, nonlinear function applications. Every once in a while, I take that intermediate array and replace half the numbers with zero. Okay, so that's dropout. So you, you're going to say, you know, why are you lobotomizing half of your brain every time you're basically doing an operation? Well, because it actually helps you learn. So let's try that first, so you believe me, and then try to explain it. Okay. So this is the, the squig line is the lobotomized neural net. So when it's trying to learn, every time it actually does a layer, I erase half of its intermediate results. Okay, and look at what happens. First of all, these, these are the training set. This is the uh, old model, this is the new model. The new model can't get quite to zero. Okay, it can't memorize the training set as well as the simple model without dropout. However, on the test set, it's doing better. So this gap, which was the overfitting gap, actually gets reduced. So at the cost of not doing as well on the training set, we basically achieved our main goal of doing better on never before seen data. Okay? Now, there is a lot of hand wavy explanations of why dropout works. Um, nothing that fully convinces me yet, but I can actually uh, uh, tell you some, uh, wave my hands a little bit, but basically this is it. Uh, if, you, if you're gonna remember one lesson from this, noise is good, okay? adding noise to your inputs, adding noise to your intermediate uh, values, adding noise to your gradients. Every type of noise seems to help generalization. Okay? So these neural nets that learn under stress of lots of noise learn better than the ones that are actually looking at clean data and uh, studying undisturbed. Is it a way to get off some of um, So that's a very good suggestion. Is it a way to get out from local optima? Um, the answer is probably not because local optima aren't uh, the big problem we thought they were in the 90s, okay? So it turns out back in the 90s when I was first being taught about neural networks, uh, my professor drew a uh, you know, fitness function thing that looked like this, he said, okay, neural network uh, ob uh, objective functions aren't convex, so they have lots of local minima, and that's the problem with neural networks, okay? So when people really, really looked at it, and uh, you can basically do this experiment yourself, modifying one of my notebooks. Let's say we, we plot our initial W and its loss, and our final W and its loss, and during the training, you know, at every time you take a step, you record the loss you have, between the initial and final W, uh, you will see that there is no zigzagging. There is no local minima, okay? So it turns out that if you have a highly over-parameterized model, if you have millions and millions of parameters, more parameters than you need, the, uh, there, you obviously have lots of local minima in this space, but all local minima are at the same level as the global minimum pretty much. So no matter which one you fall into, you're doing just as good, okay? But some of these things actually do better on the test set, and some of them don't. So how can you explain the sensitivity of the initial weight? Yeah, there is no local minima. I'm not saying there is no local minima. <laughs> there is a lot more saddle points than local minima, first of all. And the saddle points, you know, uh, basically make the job of the optimization a lot harder. Okay? So, uh, but the, the thing that drop out is, if dropout was getting us out of local minima, we would ac actually expect the training curve to get better because that's the function that we're optimizing, right? We don't, we don't even know about the test function when we're actually optimizing. We only know about the training data. So if the problem was getting stuck on a local minima on the training data, when we use dropout, we would expect that curve to get better. 
it's getting worse. But you have to, to think that all the, all the detainee data contains errors. So if the, the testing always the same as the screening, if there is an error, isn't it? The test is, I don't know exactly what you, what you mean what there. What I mean is that the training data itself has errors. Of course. Yeah, so if you're testing very close to training, if there is an error, but the, the, the fact that there's this gap means they're not that close, right? So I'm learning a lot of errors or noise about the training data that doesn't apply to the test data. They're obviously not the same. And adding noise during the training process basically lessens that effect. Yes? To be sure of what your buses of the model, wouldn't it be better to do K-fold cross-validation instead of using the three-mail training and testing set? K-fold cross-validation is good if you want to measure your test set accuracy better. Right now, I have 10,000 examples in my test set, so I'm more than confident enough in my estimates. So if you're you know, guessing a percentage based on N samples, the accuracy of that get, uh, sam uh, estimate is basically changes with one over square root of N, right? So if I actually have 10,000 examples, and I'm guessing 92% accuracy, let's say, the standard error on that thing is 1%. So I don't really need to do the trick of, you know, the uh, cross-validation, et cetera, because I have enough test data. If you want higher accuracy and uh, a lower standard error in your estimate, you can use um, cross-validation. Or if you have fewer data, you want to get a better estimate, you can use cross-validation. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. So what, what is generally done, that's a good point. So typically what we see, I mean, it's not that bad here, but sometimes what we see is the training curve goes like this and the test curve goes like this and then starts going back up, right? So you don't want to actually be over-optimizing on the training set and letting the test set go get worse and worse. But if we actually stopped when the test set was at its best, that would be cheating, why? because I made a decision based on something on the test set during training, which means I introduced bias and it's no longer representative of never before seen data. So in order to not do that, people use three different sets, a training set, a validation set, and a test set. So the validation set is like the test set, it's a small data set, but it's used exactly for what you're saying. I basically stop the training when the validation performance is the best, <coughs> but I still don't look at the test set during training at all, because as soon as I look at it and make any decision based on it, they no longer can be used to estimate my future performance. Yes? yes. Uh, you can drop out that it's nothing to do with the part split or addition, it just looks a little bit similar to me because you're basically... Okay, so here's, here's two things that Hinton hand waves around. Let me give you some examples. One is, he basically says overfitting uh, involves coordination between many different units inside the neural network. And if you're a neural network unit in the middle and half of your inputs are dying and it's another random half every time, you can't really coordinate with them really well and you know, memorize these very specific patterns. So you have to learn general things that are useful uh, for never before seen data. So that's one hand wavy explanation here. The other one is basically he says, since I'm killing half of my neural network every time and, and another random half every time, uh, every time I'm actually training a slightly different network, okay? And that means I have an ensemble of these half networks that I'm training. And at the end, I use them all together. So I'm basically taking advantage of this ensemble effect, okay? Like, uh, bugging. Yes. So, However, at the end of the same paper, they say, oh, you know, th this, you know, replacing these units with zeros, you know, there's a beautiful ensemble explanation, but we also introduced Gaussian noise and it also helps. And that doesn't jive with the ensemble explanation. So uh, I'm sure there is more and better papers written since the original one explaining why this is doing. Well. something about how repetitive are these, uh, these kind of results? Because if you think about, for example, a 
might have to go with no problem, but if you want to think about automatic uh, dri driverless cars, uh -huh. at one point you train a network and it doesn't recognize a woman, and the other one it does. And then you run it again, but you, you screw up something else. So repetition, being able to repeat your, uh, your computations uh, generally we consider a good idea. Um, so do you, do you mean like research replication wise, you know, no, looking at a picture? Um, I mean, that, that's sort of general experimental design, general research uh, no, I problem, run right? Algorithm, the random algorithm will give me different results every time. Because it depends on the random feature. The thing is, if you can actually pull this, and we will, if you can pull this uh, error from, you know, 2%, 3% all the way to half a percent, that's a significant improvement, right? So it's not like forgetting something and remembering something else. It's actually genuinely improving the network. So usually that's what we look for. We, we look for significant improvements to the network. So doing these modifications doesn't usually, you know, lose some old things and gain some new things. They literally answer many, many questions that you weren't able to answer before. And if you want replicatability, I mean, this is a dumb answer, but you know, you can you know, set the random seed uh, in the beginning to something and you can get the exact same network every time. All right, so that was dropout. And uh, in this final experiment, I, I, I tried to get the best results from this um, multilinear perceptrons. I increased the hidden units from 64 to 256 and still had kept dropout. And finally, I got you know, this is my uh, training error, this is my test error. I got to around 1.5% test error, which is about the best I was able to do with a regular multilayer perceptron on this problem. In order to improve this result even further, we need to change the architecture, which is what I'm going to show you next, a convolutional network. Questions? Is the test error measured with the dropout layer still running? Yes, dropout is running in all of these. Anytime you see this squiggly training curves, it's dropout. So I know this is a parameter to turn it off as a training test training if, if we want. Yes. Um, it's, it's automatically turned off, I think. If I wrote the code correctly, it should actually. I thought that changed recently. It used to look like if it was, if it was automatic differentiation was happening, but. In KNET in particular? Which one? Uh, are you talking about the recent change in KNET that I did in particular? Okay, so I, I, I actually tried to make it very automatic and in the uh, process introduced a bug, so I, I had to undo that. So maybe that's where you're getting at, but we can talk offline about that particular issue. Okay, convolutional networks, which is basically what VGG is an example of. So we're going to train a tiny little VGG on this set, uh, on this problem, and show that it can improve us even further. So now remember, we went from 92% accuracy to 98.5% accuracy. That's where we are right now. Okay? With dropout, everything increased the network size. That's where we ended up. To go further, we need to do convolutions. Now, convolutional networks rely on two semi-independent ideas. One, sparse connections, and two, weight sharing, okay? So let me um, try to describe these ideas very briefly. Sparse connection means a unit in a particular layer, in a regular fully connected MLP, is connected to all the units in the previous layer. That's what matrix multiplication does, right? So when you do a um, transformation with matrix multiplication, the result, in, in any number in the result, depends on all the numbers in the input, okay? It's a linear combination of all those numbers. Now, in sparsely connected neural networks, and also in the human visual system, things don't work that way. You look at a neuron, it's only connected to, you know, your visual cortex back in your head, you look at one of the neurons there, it's only connected to a particular patch of the visual field, not the whole visual field. So convolutional networks take advantage of that. 
So each number in a convolutional network gets affected by a limited set of uh, a, a local patch in the previous layer. Second thing, weight sharing. Um, especially prob in problems like image recognition, when you learn a good pattern that works, let's say, for the upper left half, uh, upper left corner, let's say you're trying to recognize cats and your you know, network discovered this great pattern that can recognize cats in the upper left corner of the image. Well, that same pattern will probably work in the lower right corner, right? So you want to replicate those weights in every area of the image. So convolutional networks is basically the combination of these two ideas. Okay, have local inputs, local patches as your inputs instead of the whole previous layer. And number two, share weights so that the same patterns that are looking at one patch are also looking at another patch. So it becomes, you know, if you can recognize something in one part of the image, you can recognize it in another part. Okay, so... Um, uh, this is a great visualization of convolution, but we don't have time to go into details. It's a linear operation, but it does the two things that I mentioned. It does uh, local patches and weight sharing, and that's all I'm going to say about it right now. Now here is how we can write a convolutional network in Julia. This is again uh, a pure Julia implementation. Uh, the original network that this represents, the Lenet, uh, the original implementation was done in Cafe. It was about 200 lines long. By using for loops and stuff, we were able to express it um, a lot uh, more succinctly. And even though this looks like a lot of code, I'm going to show you a few things and it's going to become simple, okay? So first of all, this part is exactly the same as from before. You know, I'm doing a dropout, I'm doing a linear function, I'm doing a ReLU, right? This is what we, we, did, we did before. So the, my inputs are W and X again. W is again a bunch of weights, okay? This time um, I separate convolution weights from regular uh, linear weights by looking at their dimensionality. Remember I told you that image people like to work with four-dimensional tensors? Uh, their weights, the convolution weights, are also four-dimensional tensors. So I basically say if WI is four-dimensional, then do the convolution thing. If WI is two-dimensional, then the full, do the fully connected thing. And if not, then you don't know what you're going to do. And that's it. So this is the same code as before, except it supports also four-dimensional convolutional uh, weight tensors, okay? Now, we can implement a lot of different neural networks with this pattern just by changing the array, the W array of weights that we have. Uh, we can decide how many convolutional layers to put in, how many linear layers to put in, and I'm going to do that in the next slide. For example, this is the definition of Lenet. Uh, the network that actually uh, successfully recognized digits in the 90s, the first successful convolutional network. So 28 by 28 by 1 is our dimensionality for the input tensor. Remember, every one of our images was 28 by 28 by 1. Uh, the next argument, 5 by 5 by 20, says have 20 different filters, each of which look at a 5 by 5 region of the image. Okay, and then in the next layer, we have another bank of filters, 50 different filters that are each looking at five by five uh, areas of the image. And then after that, a single number 500 indicates that this is a normal linear layer that converts the whole thing into a 500 dimensional vector and then convert that to a 10 dimensional vector and you're done. Okay, so if we give these size parameters to the initialization function that I uh, skipped over in the previous slide, I get the necessary random weights. So the first uh, set of convolution weights is 5 by 5 by 1 by 20, and here is 5 by 5 by 20 by 50, etc. So um, I know I'm skipping over convolution operation without describing it really well, but um, I just want you to see the effect without too much time. Yeah. So what you're doing there, the first parameter, you're defining the format of the images, and 
then the parameters of this convolution are later? Correct. Okay. So the first entry is the format of the image. And then the 500 is a matrix layer or dense layer? And so the triples yeah. represent convolutional layers. Yeah. They basically say, you know, the convolution dimensions and how many filters there should be. And individual numbers are linear layers. So that's sort of the convention that I made up. Um, and if you initialize it randomly, we get the famous loss 2.3. That hasn't changed. Let's train this. Okay. I am definitely cheating here because this normally takes 230 seconds. And let's plot. How come plotting is the slowest element of my demos? <laughs> Okay, so a couple things to point out here. Um, so these two curves are the multilayer perceptron that we've seen before. These two curves are the convolutional one. So the first thing to notice is that the convolutional network converges a lot more faster, right? So even at like five epochs, we're at 99% accuracy, both on the training and the test set, okay? So it comes down faster, comes down lower, it actually does get to 0% on the training set, um, and its error rate on the test set is about half a percent, okay? It overfits a lot less. It converges faster, it overfits less. This is what happens when you actually have a model that reflects the inductive biases of your data, okay? So we design, this convolutional network has been designed to take advantage of the fact that these are images we're looking at. The fully connected networks that we looked at before don't. For example, if we shuffled all the pixels, they would still perform the same. They would still do 98.5%. Even though you can't recognize the digits, they would. Because they don't care about the fact that this pixel is next to that pixel and these things form a patch. They have no idea about the locality they have no idea about what the input domain is. They're a very generic type of model. That's why uh, we can't get any better than, you know, one and a half percent error with those. Whereas a convolutional network has a lot of built-in features that I tried to explain that take advantage of the fact that this is an image, and that's why it converges faster and gets better. And we now have a 99.5 percent accuracy on the test set with our convolutional network. And that's pretty much the world record, so congratulations. Okay, so I know I skipped over the details of convolution fast, but um, the takeaway is basically there's different types of layers that, basic, that uh, do better on images in terms of both convergence and overfitting. Question? So the loss keeps changing. The loss never gets to zero, right? So if remember that I actually produce scores which get converted to probabilities. So I can make those probabilities more and more extreme. I mean, I can have, you know, 20% probability assigned to the correct answer. And then I can train some more and it'll become 50%, it'll become 90%, it'll become 99%, 99.9%. So the loss will keep improving throughout that time, even though the answers don't change. It's still the same score that's winning. So we often see that loss keeps dropping, for example, on the training set, where the accuracy or the error uh, remains flat. That means it's not changing its mind about answers, it's making its opinions stronger about the same answers, okay? Sort of like the current political climate, right? Nobody's changing their ideas, everybody's, you know, insisting that they're more right every day. Um, so the other thing, um, how come the test set is improving? I'm, I'm not sure about that. It's, I don't think it's improving that much after epoch 50 or so. So this is pretty much flat. Um, but any, any slight improvement is basically due to the fact that this guy is still trying to uh, lower the loss on the training set. 
Any other questions? Right. Right. Is there like a back and forth between the CPU and the GPU in every iteration of that portal, or is the whole portal of loaded? Um, okay, so good question, very good question. The whole for loop is not offloaded. So where is my for loop? Here is the for loop. Okay. So the for loop always runs on the CPU, but if W and X are arrays on the GPU, then all the important operations like dropping out X, convolutioning it with WI and applying ReLU to it, these operations all take place on the GPU. So the CPU is like the task master. Okay, there is a opaque data structure in the GPU memory. I have no idea what it is. Okay, it's not in my memory as the CPU, but I'm telling it, okay, now drop that out and then you know, do this convolution to it and do that to it. The CPU is telling all that. So the for loop is completely on the CPU. As long as, okay, so there's two types of latency. There is a um, data transfer latency, which is really bad. And I'm not doing any of that here because all the arrays remain on the GPU, right? Um, but there is also the kernel launch latency. And I am actually uh, feeling that punishment here. So, so I wonder how this performs compared to frameworks that are really optimized. Oh, I can, I can answer that. Right, so I'm glad somebody asked that question. So there's a bunch of benchmarks that we implemented. So these are the initial benchmarks. These are the Dynet dynamic benchmarks. But this is, this is the most recent one. Uh, this guy, Ilya Karman, actually compared like a dozen different frameworks. Um, and this is for VGG style image recognition. Uh, and this is the time it takes to tra train, you know, some number of epochs on a uh, fixed GPU. And here's Knet. It's at 159. The champion in this case is MXNet at 145. And here is, you know, Keras Lasagna with Teano. This is Keras with TensorFlow. This is TensorFlow. TensorFlow is usually not that great. Here's PyTorch. So we're doing good here. Uh, this is RNNs. So in the RNN, we tie with MXNet, okay? And here is uh, TensorFlow is pretty close, PyTorch is built. This is basically reflecting Python versus Julia because everybody is calling the same GPU kernels in this case. And this is the uh, ResNet 50 feature extraction, which means there is no training, there is just testing. We're just actually processing images. And here we're basically at uh, 160 images per second, and we're number one. We're ahead of TensorFlow and PyTorch and MXNet. This the higher numbers mean good here on the GPU. But the same code is horrible on the CPU because my CPU kernels suck. Okay, so I, I need students to implement better convolution kernels on the CPU. Um, but on the GPU, when everybody is calling the same NVIDIA kernels, uh, how, you can ask, if everybody's calling the same kernels, how can Julia be faster? Because everybody else is paying the Python penalty. Okay? I'm not quite sure why MXNet lost this one. But, um, yeah, you're a good point. So, but in general, yes, performance-wise, we're not that, that, that far away from the pack. Yeah. The MXNet tested here, is it the, the Julia one or the one that... This is original MXNet. Yeah, the, the only Julia code, Julia entry here is the Knet one. All the other ones are the original packages. Any other questions? How much time do we have? Oh, more here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Didn't see. Yeah. Um, there is a good thing if you put the whole loop on GPU. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a, you're talking about putting the whole program on the GPU. There is a limit on the types of things you can run on the GPU, basically, right? So, um, so yes, for example, uh, a complicated model module like LSTM, 
if you actually program it in Julia step by step, uh, every time making a kernel call to uh, the GPU for matrix multiplications and other operations within the LSTM, that runs slower than writing a custom kernel on the GPU that does the whole LSTM with one kernel call. So that, that, that is an advantage. But then writing CUDA code is a horrible experience, so you don't want to keep doing that every time you have a new model, right? So Julia gives you a lot more flexibility in expressing yourself. So it's, it depends what, which penalty you want to pay. Um, another answer is there is CUDA native. Our new, uh, we have a package that actually compiles pure Julia code into the GPU directly instead of going through CUDA and C. So you can write Julia uh, functions and run them as CUDA kernels. So that could be another uh, possibility. Yeah. Is it implement normalization and batch normalization? Is it normalization in Julia or is it implemented with the with CUDA as well? Right now, on t that answer changes. Like two months ago, it was Julia. Right now, it's CUDNN. We usually, CUDNN keeps adding new stuff. They didn't used to have batch normalization, so we wrote our own. But then they added batch normalization, so we benchmark whichever is faster, we call that one. Dropout, for example, th theirs is not faster, so we call the Julia dropout right now, or our own kernel right now. So typically for all of these operations, matrix multiplication, convolution, you know, dropout, etc., you basically have to compare the different implementations and just pick the fastest one. Yes? Um, I'm not sure about who's using it. Uh, I know researchers are using it, and uh, there is about 600 stars and you know downloads and stuff, so it's it's fairly active. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm not always sure who's using it and who's contributing to it. And random people start contributing stuff, which makes me very happy. And uh, but yeah, it doesn't have the same type of marketing that some of these other packages do, so. Um, I guess we need more. <laughs> so yeah, so it's not as popular as them right now. Yes. Um, yeah, so we have tools for writing. So the, the CUDA stack is much more mature, but there's actually a toolkit called GPU Race.gl, which you can use to compile Julia code to either the, uh, the uh, to, um, OpenCL. to OpenCL or CUDA. Um, and at a higher level, um, that's if you're writing kernels, but actually at a higher level, you can use CL arrays, CUDA arrays, or the Knet array type. And if you just use that array and run it through your code, then you're going to get code that runs on that GPU or code that runs faster than the CPU. So at the high level, you don't really have to worry about this at all, and you can run code pretty much anywhere. Well, that's a good question. So that's something we're kind of hoping to work on and have plans to build in future. Um, it's not something we have right now, but Julia is generally very good at compiling to all these different kinds of hardware. We already support a huge number of you know different like random pieces of hardware that people have, so it's something we're aiming to do in future. Say it again. Oh, excellent. <laughs> Um, so, I guess one more thing that I can show is uh, if you want to see more examples of implemented models, the examples directory of KNET JL is a good good resource. You know, we have you know VGGs and stuff implemented here as well, and I also have my students contributing to uh, this repo. Oh, this GitHub. Okay, so the, here, for example, we have in Julia implemented all the NLP demos I showed you. Uh, this is the GAN, GANs are the new, you know, kid on the block that's very popular these days. Relational network is another uh, natural language visual question answering model. Um, neural style transfer, um, I've mentioned. So basically, I teach a class where within a semester, the kids are supposed to implement a recently developed model from archive, uh, starting from zero. And uh, when they do a good job, we uh, try to put their, uh, make their projects public. So the model zoo, 
both on the flux side and the KNF side is growing every day. Uh, and uh, more contributions are of course welcome, but when you start developing something, you don't have to start from scratch. There's probably somebody who wrote something similar that you can use as a base. Yes? Um, compared to other frameworks, I think mainly Julia. I, uh, but that's, uh, um, don't quote me on that. I think, I always assume people are paying the Python penalty. That's what they're, because at the end, most of us are calling the same GPU kernels. All the support glue code that goes around that runs a lot more efficiently if you're using Julia. So it's know. worth pointing out also that uh, none of these frameworks are really doing anything that different from each other. So if you have a TensorFlow model, for example, what you're doing is there's still a program there, there's still a program with control flow and for loops and so on. You just happen to have built that program using the graph API. And so effectively you're doing a kind of metaprogramming to build that program up, uh, that model. Um, and then when TensorFlow takes that program, it has to run an interpreter over it. And it goes through each operation you have, each map model, each broadcast and so on, and launches a CUDA kernel for that which is the exact same thing that we do, it's the same thing that PyTorch does and so on. Actually, the advantage that we have there is that um, we, because, you know, because Julia is compiled, we actually don't have to run the interpreter over the model. We can just run it you know, straight off very quickly. Um, the other thing, the, the point to add to that maybe is that with something like a MexNet, the MexNet can do fancier things like it does better memory allocation, um, so it's good for very large models. But then that kind of thing comes at the expense of a MexNet not ever supporting things like control flow. Um, so you can't do a lot of interesting kinds of event, like NLP models with that, with that framework. Um, so the goal we have with Julia is to kind of always support the maximum flexibility. You can always write any kind of model. If you can write down the forward pass, it works. Um, and we, you know, we're trying to make that as fast as possible. And obviously, as you can see, you know, doing a reasonable job of getting to state of the art performance with that. That kind of depends on having something more parametric and less free code, right? If you have it in this, this like TensorFlow language, which is like more like an yeah, like a syntax tree for networks, then some transformation and engine can act on that. But if you have pretty written Julia code, it will probably make it much harder for an automatic optimizer to then take a train network and so what uh, TensorFlow has is a compiler, basically, and the compiler looks at the source code that you've built up, and it does optimizations on it. Um, actually, that's fine, because Julia also has a compiler. Um, the trick there is that in order to take advantage of that stuff, we have to do optimizations which aren't necessarily suitable for a general purpose language. So a general purpose compiler like Julia doesn't need to know about things like uh, optimizing your model by running uh, different tasks on different CUDA streams, for example or fusing certain you know, convolutions with broadcast functions and, and all these kind of like ML specific optimizations. Um, but actually we can add those compiler passes into the Julia compiler and this is what uh, my talk on Wednesday will actually be about. Um, we can kind of have a package like Flux or like Knet that says, here's a compiler pass that adds model parallelism into your, your model. And we're able to take Julia's IR, which is essentially just another kind of graph format and apply completely standard you know, compiler optimizations and do the same things that all those frameworks are aiming to do. Um, so yeah, we're, we're kind of still getting to the point where we're kind of pushing on GPU kernels and all these other things, but we're gradually pushing into this territory which hasn't been explored before, which is like kind of compiler work. So that's gonna be exciting for the next year or so of work. I can add two cents to that discussion based on my old slide, excuse the Turkish title, but um, so basically if the model you're trying to build is made out of boxes that people support, then it doesn't really matter which framework you use, whatever framework you have, the standard convolution box, standard fully connected box, you can put them together and do something with it. Now, but if you're a researcher and you're trying to develop new compound models that you know, combine RNNs and CNNs or do something completely different, like for example, the VQA that I just showed you uses a totally different box. It's not an LSTM, it's called a Maxel. They just came up with it, etc. Uh, if that box does not exist, let's say in TensorFlow right now, then you have to dive down into their C++ code in order to do anything about it, okay? 
And if you actually look at uh, underneath PyTorch, underneath TensorFlow, you know, below the surface of shiny surface of the easily accessible boxes is very convoluted code that is hard to get into. Okay? The advantage of Julia is below Julia, there is still Julia. Below Knet, everything is still Julia. You can actually, the, the source code of Knet is not that long. You can actually change everything, build your own boxes. And uh, I made these examples especially in pure Julia code because I didn't want too many layers of abstraction. I, I, was, I, I tried to show you that even without using any layers of abstraction, you can get concise code that expresses everything and hides nothing. Okay? So, of course, you can also build boxes in Julia and you know, form any abstractions you want. Uh, but in research mode, I think, uh, Julia challenge because implementing new ideas is a lot easier. And this is my cartoon uh, showing the evolution of uh, regular computer languages throughout the ages and the parallel evolution that we've been seeing the last five years in the uh, deep learning frameworks. <laughs> okay, thanks very much everyone. Thanks, Thank Dennis. You.